sir you are live you can start oh very good evening everyone again welcome to the uh, next edition of master class this is the uh, ninth uh, master class in series and this is uh, on very important topic called acute on chronic liver failure as you know we had a last lecture on crohn's disease by dr vinita huja and i think all of you will agree that it was a talk which are masterly delivered by dr ahuja and we received a lot of emails phone calls sms and and on facebook comments also all the, uh, all suggesting that this talk was wonderful you have conveyed your feelings to dr ahuja and he in turn has sent his thanks to you uh, for watching uh, his talk on isc master class you you are aware that uh, we have put all the previous lectures on two platforms that is uh, uh, facebook and and also on isg website which is uh, isg website and in isg website you will find there is a isg library and if you open a library you can see all the talks uh, uh, you can see there totally talks but also we have placed all the responses to questions which were asked during uh, the uh, master class so they all have been put there also you might like to go there and see them again coming back to today's lecture today's lecture is on acute and chronic liver failure and for, for that we have a, no other than a dr vivek saraswat uh, all of you know that vivek saraswat uh, is a head of gastroenterology at sgp jail lucknow he is the president of isc and he had been the past president of uh, inasal we know that dr saraswat is a great teacher and he has a lot of interest in teaching and education and uh, and 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 he has a huge fan following in the country uh, he is a keen researcher so we'll uh, we, we are sure that we'll have again we'll have a one more treat uh, of of uh, of academics today uh, by listening to dr vivek saraswat and to moderate this session uh, we have invited dr akash sukla and you, all of you know dr akash sukla is a professor and head of gastroenterology at king edward memorial hospital and a gs state uh, medical college in mumbai and akash is one of the best known hepatologist in our country uh, thank you akash for uh, agreeing to moderate the session we had uh, viewers from not only from india but uh, isg master class is viewed by almost uh, uh, 15 other countries and uh, including bangladesh pakistan and many other neighboring countries uh, for this master class uh, one of the important thing that you can ask questions and we spend a lot of time uh, on questions uh, during mid break of the talk and also at end of the talk and uh, you can put your question in the chat box which is there uh, which is there next to your screen you can put your question and we'll try to include as much as possible and what is left out will uh, will send to dr saraswat uh, for his response to these questions later coming to today's format again uh, will this talk will be for 40 minutes so we'll break at about uh, uh, 20 minutes uh, take some questions uh, which doc, which will moderate by dr uh, akash sukla and then we go back to his talk uh, uh, to the second half of his talk and again take more questions one important thing we had on feedback that uh, how can we make this platform more interactive and as promised we tried and we have created uh, this platform therefore uh, we'll put some questions uh, today will be some testing types we'll send questions to you and you can respond to these questions uh, uh, and we'll see how was the response if we if we succeed we'll include more frequently in next next uh, master classes with this uh, may i invite dr vivek saraswat to speak to you uh, welcome dr saraswat thank you dr govin uh i'd like to thank uh, dr govin and dr akash for uh, uh, this uh, presentation and for this invitation to talk to you on the topic of acute on uh, chronic liver failure govin has already given you the background and uh, the continuing series of isg master classes uh for beginning this talk i have an uh, beginning with a question and a very fundamental question that has been asked to me by no one other than professor jang dilawri the former chief of hepatology at uh, pgi chandigarh 
and his question is what difference has the knowledge or application of the term aclf acute on chronic liver failure made to the management of liver failure uh, it can't get more fundamental than that a uh, simple straight answer um, uh, delavri sir is that we would be calling a rose by any na na other name the rose smells as sweet the management of aclf would not actually change but i'd like to answer your question in uh, the in the way of one of our parables from hindu mythology and uh, you know the samudra manthan is something that indian mythology talks about when the meru parvat and the vasuki snake were used by the danavas and the devas and the danavas to uh, churn the oceans and this churning of the oceans today the churning of the oceans of ignorance and hepatology by bodies like ark and the indian consortium as well as the cliff and the american consortium the european and the american consortium has led to a lot of new insights and a lot of useful information surfacing and which some of which i will try to cover with you in the next 40 45 minutes and none less than the sage dhanvantari who is uh, credited with the uh, um, starting modern starting ayurvedic medic medicine in the uh, mythology with the amrit kumbh you know all about the kumbh melas and the ardh kumbh surfaced and uh, many other good things also happened as a result of the churning of the oceans so the term aclf has served as the seed for a lot of hepatologists to do a lot of work in hepatology and uh, streamline our knowledge now to come to the definition of the term acute on chronic liver failure at last count over 47 definitions 73 prognostic markers and three validated prognostic indices had been reported for this entity the very original decision the definition was first articulated by rajiv jalan way back in 2002 and mentioned acute deterioration in liver function over a short period of time resulting in a high sofa or apache 2 score with jaundice and either encephalopathy or renal uh, failure however the first formal definition was put forward by dr shiv sarin as a part of the apacel definition in 2009 when he talked of an acute hepatic insult resulting in jaundice and coagulopathy complicated within 4 weeks by ascites and or encephalopathy in a patient with previously diagnosed or undiagnosed chronic liver disease and the highlighted uh, words uh, carry each one of them carries their own significance well this was followed by the um, easel asld definition in 2012 dr rajiv jalan uh, enunciated aclf as an acute deterioration rather than an acute liver disease and implicating a precipitating event which eventually resulted in a severe form of liver failure with increased mortality at 3 months due to multi organ system failure uh an effort at unifying both the eastern and the western views was done by a panel of distinguished authors headed by rajiv jalan and including professor acharya and many other workers from this part of the world and they pro the wgo proposed that in a patient with chronic liver disease which is non fibrotic chronic liver disease any one of these precipitants can be superimposed and lead to the development of what was termed as type a aclf on the other hand if the underlying chronic liver disease were compensated liver cirrhosis the same set of precipitants could also result in aclf which was type b aclf resulting in hepatic and extra hepatic organ failures while decompensated cirrhosis decompensation in these well known forms of jaundice ascites bleeding or encephalopathy if that was the substratum an acute insult due to any one of these agents superimposed on that would result in what was called a type c aclf so non cirrhotic aclf it's a very major insult that results in acute in development of organ failures in a compensated cirrhotic which is the classic indian acla what we commonly see patient doesn't know he has cirrhosis he is perfectly well develops acute hepatitis and within 4 weeks he is decompensated that is uh, type b aclf while in the west things like alcoholic hepatitis variceal bleeding sepsis 
Precip on an unknown patient who has previously been decompensated precipitates what is known as type C ACLF. So this has led to what the WGO definition today is. ACLF is a syndrome in a patient with chronic liver disease with or without previously diagnosed cirrhosis with acute decompensation in the form of jaundice and or and prolongation of the INR with one or more extrahepatic organ failure associated with increased mortality at 28 days and up to three months from onset, while the latest 2019 ARC definition is very close, if not matching, except for a few words here and there. ACLF is an acute hepatic insult. Bilirubin levels and INR are specified. Complicated within four weeks, a time frame is mentioned with ascites and encephalopathy and or encephalopathy and they've added an increased 28 day mortality so you can see that convergence that the churning going on over the last two decades is already resulting in a fair amount of convergence in the definitions now the concept of acute and chronic liver failure is well illustrated in this uh, slide from uh, the 2014 consensus by professor serene describing the different forms of liver failure Acute liver failure and acute insult leads to a precipitous decline in liver failure, crossing the thresholds of liver failure and thresholds of multi-organ failure and often resulting in mortality unless the course is either spontaneous reversal or rescue by liver transplant happens. In decompensated liver disease, already the threshold of liver reserve is down because of uh, previous chronic liver disease and an acute result Insult results in deterioration below the threshold of liver failure and organ failure and may be fatal. But there's hardly if any reversibility and there is a slow worsening in this uh, um, uh, situation. Acute and chronic liver failure on the other hand starts from a lower baseline than uh, um, uh, acute but better than decompensated chronic liver disease. Often they are compensated crosses the various thresholds and retains the potential for reversibility as the acute insult uh, is, um, uh, runs its course and the patient is supported through the episode. But usually they return to a baseline which is below the pre-decompensation baseline in the given individual. So comparing the um, apazel and the easel concepts, as you can see, there are minor differences, but probably the central difference is that the apazel group thinks and the South Asian groups feel that liver failure is the central feature of ACLF, which is responsible for poor outcomes, while extrahepatic organ failure is felt to be the major cause in the subset of patients described by Easel Cliff. Again, sepsis and variceal bleeding are con uh, considered precipitants by the Easel Cliff group, but are discussed and uh, thought uh, not to be precipitants by the Apazel school of thought. Now, coming to the spectrum of acute and chronic liver failure in India, uh, between 2009 and 2017, over 10 series with over 1,400 patients, beginning with what was an HEV ACLF series we reported from Lucknow, and going through all the major centers, as you can see, mainly in the northern part of our country, had been uh, reported. But probably, probably the most authoritative uh, series is the one published by the Indian, the Inazil Consortium in 2016, in which over a thousand patients who were identified to have ACLF in the previous one year were pooled together and Shalimar led this work up from the All India Institute. This uh, study used the Apazel 2009 definition, but the cliff sofa severity definitions were used for want of a, any of an alternative at that point in time. This is a list of the centers and the contribution from these centers. And this pie chart shows you what the acute precipitants were found to be. And as you will see, over 36% of patients reported, centers reported alcohol as the commonest acute precipitant, while the flare of a viral infection or a super infection by HAV or HEV was responsible for one in five patients with acute precipitants. While this pie diagram of the underlying chronic liver disease again shows that the commonest underlying cause was alcohol in almost 60% of patients followed by cryptogenic and underlying viral cirrhosis. The, uh, underlining the changing demography of liver disease in India in the last couple of decades.
Now, the outcomes of acute and chronic liver failure in the Indian in the nasal series was a 42% in hospital mortality, 32% when the viral insult was the acute uh, precipitant, while in alcoholics, you can see a very poor 50% survival or 50% mortality almost was seen in this group. The important thing to see is two thirds of these people, the central organ that failed was the liver failure. Other extrahepatic organs also failed in smaller numbers, one third adrenal coagulation and so on. But liver failure was the dominant organ to fail in two thirds. And looking at the severity of the uh, disease, ACLF, 83% mortality was known, seen when the simple organ failure count was five and was only 11% when none of the organs had failed. While using the Cliff SOFA definition, there was a 63% mortality in people who had ACLF3. Applying the various prognostic scoring indicators like uh, MELD, Cliff SOFA, Apache, and CTP, the OROC for Cliff SOFA was, was found to be the best, but as you can see at 0.66, it was not great. These generic uh, prognostic criteria didn't seem to perform very well for ACLF. Now coming to the assessment of severity and the prognostic scores that I used for ACLF, the seminal study that and the database that has triggered this work was the canonic group, that is the CLIF, the chronic liver um, failure group from Europe, which conducted the acute on chronic liver failure in cirrhosis study led by Richard Morrow in 2013. Over 2000 patients with acute decompensation were included 13 out of 100 of whom could be enrolled after exclusions. 300 of them had acute and chronic liver failure, while another 112 developed acute and chronic failure in the subsequent 12 days. And this cohort had a transplant-free mortality of about 30 to 34%, and a 90-day mortality of about 50% related to multi-organ failure. This group also defined how to identify organ failure in ACLF by modifying the sequential organ failure assessment scores that are very familiar to intensivists and in most ICUs to suit chronic liver failure. And uh, as this table shows, organ failures for six organs were scored from zero to four. And the highlighted scores show you the cutoff values above which organ failure was identified to be present. Using this in this paper, survival with single organ failures was shown and survival with, um, with one or more organ failures is shown in this table. The 28-day mortality threshold of 15% was chosen by this group to mark the entity of ACLF. That is by definition, ACLF one or more would have a mortality of 15% or higher. And in this cohort, you can see the 28-day mortality in the gray and the 90-day mortality in the black bars. Below 10% in those in whom the, they were categorized as no ACLF, while ACLF with one, two, and three or more organ failures had mortality progressively going up to 70% and 80% for ACLF3. Now, in continuation with this work on this database, Rajiv Jalan and co-workers published the Cliff organ failure scoring system that is using the definitions of organ failures previously, previously enunciated, they scored each organ failure from one to three using the cutoffs shown in this table so that the Cliff organ failure score ranged between zero to 18. And these gray boxes show the cutoff values at which organ failure was diagnosed to be present as per this table. Importantly, in this table, they did not, they found that they were missing two important variables, age and the white blood cell count, which were included to develop a Cliff C ACLF score. And this score was normalized so that its values ranged from zero to 100. And this is now being widely used uh, to assess the severity, particularly when uniformity is needed in inclusion criteria and assessing uh, uh, prospective trials for um, various interventions or therapies. And using this background, they compared the accuracy of the Cliff C ACLF for 28 day and 30 day mortality in comparison with other indices like the MELD, MELD sodium, and the child puce score. And as you can see, uh, the uh, mortality, the AUROCs were the best for Cliff C ACLF at about 0.79 and 0.76 at uh, 90 days. 
and they have also from the same group published recently the utility of this in identifying futility of treatment for patients with ACLF. A cutoff of 70 Cliff C ACLF score was seen to delineate, differentiate between survivors and non-survivors very effectively. And patients with ACLF3 and a Cliff C ACLF score of more than 70 had a dismal outcome with, at a, within 28 days with a higher mortality. So the group suggests that this may be used as a cutoff and more prospective studies using this cutoff for futility of treatment have been proposed. Now at the same time, the GB Pant and the ILBS group has performed a large number of studies as you can see here. None more important than what was published at the database from the ARC consortium, that is the APASL ACLF Research Consortium. In the 2014 edition of these ongoing guidelines, Dr. Sarin's group reviewed over 1,300 patients from 70 Asia PAC centers. And in their group, there was a 40% mortality at 20 days. This was without significant extrahepatic organ failures and was primarily due to severe liver failure. So this led the group to postulate that contrary to what has been shown by the easel group, uh, ACLF should be defined based on liver failure rather than on extrahepatic organ failure, which are likely to be a consequence of worsening liver function. They have also described an arc grading of uh, liver failure and using a system that is quite akin to um, uh, the CTP score in that there are uh, five variables given one to three points with a maximum of five to 15, very like the CTP score which gives you ACLF grades, ARC ACLF grades that are a slightly different in their scoring from childs A, B, and C, but uh, not very. And instead of the clinical parameters, you have lactate and creatinine levels included. This, they felt, better reflect the severity of liver failure, which is a central feature of the South Asian or the asia Pac uh, ACLF uh, groups. They have compared the... Um, uh, ARC scoring against other disease severity scores. And as you can see, they find that it performed better than the Cliff C ACLF score in the Asian cohort, better than SOFA, MELD, and Apache, with AUROCs of 0.8 uh, above those of MELD, SOFA, uh, Cliff SOFA, SOFA, Apache 2, and uh, CTP. Uh, they have also developed another ACLF ARC score for want of time. I have not gone into the details of their development, which instead of 0 to 100, scores from 0 to 80 and they have studied the dynamic changes somewhat like the uh, what has been done for the ACLF by Professor Acharya's group at day 0, day 4 and day 7 and they have shown how it can be used to predict interventions as I will come to later in this uh, presentation. So with this I come to the end of the first part of my um, presentation and I this is a question for the audience poll. Maybe we can also take some questions while the audience is polling their answers. On the, your screen, you will see, you can choose your option and then click the vote button at the bottom of your screens. So in the meanwhile, maybe if Akash is ready, we can probably take yeah. a few questions while the audience uh, cast their votes. Yes, sir. Uh, I think, thank you for a lovely introduction and, and uh, a brilliant overview of uh, the definitions and very interesting, this, uh, I think, uh, initiation and thought process. It was really amazing. Akash, but we have, we have flooded with questions. Akash, Akash, just one second. Uh, yes, sir. The question would have come and, uh, uh, on your, uh, your pop-up uh, on yes, your window. Sir. So please respond to uh, A, B, C, D, E and uh, we'll see the results uh, at the in, end of the talk. This is just a test question, but uh, the Sassul also asked one more question uh, during his presentation. Right. Akas, please. Akas. Yeah. So uh, the first question uh, is, has actually been asked by two people, Dr. Ratra and uh, Dr. Vishnu Agrawal from Jaipur. Uh, they have asked uh, which definition should be used uh, for our uh, routine clinical practice or for different reasons. So they've just asked what definition should be you have given uh, all the definitions yes i think uh, it's uh, uh, for what the kind of aclf we are seeing in india particularly in the northern part of our country where aclf is being uh, has most often been reported from the central feature remains severity of liver failure 
bilirubin is above 15, 20, 25. Ascites is the dominant feature and drifting into encephalopathy. And I think personally that the ARC uh, definition scores over the easel cliff for this. Also for reasons that it gives clear cutoffs. So prospectively, you know which patients you can include and apply the label of ACLF2 and include in any intervention studies you might have in mind. Unlike the easel cliff where things are a bit loose-ended, their severity is only declared once the illness has run its course and the patient has either died or recovered. So I think I personally would favor the ARC. The limitation of the ARC uh, ACLF definition had been that their severity indices and all these had not been well developed. But in the last two or three years, the ARC ACLF score as well as the uh, the, AC, the ARC uh, grading and the scoring has also come along so that can allow you to uh, grade the severity with these definitions. Uh, the next question is from, uh, again, asked by two people, Dr. Amit Joshi from Indore and Dr. Uh, Piyush Thakur from Varanasi. Both of them have said that if the patient has low bilirubin, less than five, and the other criteria for ACLF are fulfilled, would you still consider this patient as ACLF or no? Well, conceptually, this would be considered ACLF. But as we have said, the, uh, now both groups agree that a central part is poor outcomes and high incidence of organ failures with mortality. Often in the easel group, where if you have the type C ACLF, where there is an underlying chronic liver uh, de decompensated cirrhosis is present, there often with a billy below five and with kidney failure or single organ failure, the outcome is poor. But in patients who have underlying non-fibrotic uh, liver disease or who have compensated cirrhosis, if the bilirubin doesn't cross the, cross the threshold of five, generally the severity may not meet the criterion of 50% or higher mortality within 28 days. So conceptually, yes, it could be ACLF, but ACLF we are trying to identify a group with uniform severity so that we do not have a problem with the analyzing results of intervention studies. And if we include people with milder severity, it may pose a problem from this point of view. So there's one more very interesting question, which has been asked by Dr. Anirwan uh, from Dibrugar. He says, we are, can, is it possible that we apply a puzzle, that is the ARC criteria for definition, and use the easel cliff criteria for uh, prognostication, or, or <laughs> any such combinations? Right. See, I think many of us did this during the time when the ARC criteria, their severity, their scoring systems and grades were not developed. In the early years, some of our papers got accepted. For example, the Inazil Consortium paper, which applied the uh, APASL criteria for diagnosis inclusion, but applied the Cliff Consortium criteria for prognostication. But since then, I've had a few manuscripts refused by the reviewers who say no. Either you go by this one way or the other. You can't pick and choose because they are based on a different set of patients, on different uh, parameters of severity. And uh, so if you choose the APASL for inclusion, then kindly apply the, uh, yeah, the APASL ARC criteria for severity, grading, and uh, scoring. Right? So mixing and matching doesn't work any longer. So there's also another very good question by Dr. Naveen Yadav from Chodhpur. Uh, he asks... How do you differentiate between severe alcoholic hepatitis and acute on chronic liver failure? I'll just add to it. Does it really make a difference if you differentiate between the two? Yes, I think Akash, it does. But as we go along, we'll see. According to severe alcoholic hepatitis includes also those patients who cross a DF of 32 or meet other severity criteria without necessarily having florid liver failure as defined by ACLF in the form of ascites and encephalopathy without organ failure. So SAH is a broader definition in encompassing organ failure along with the um, um, uh, severe alcoholic hepatitis without organ failure. Now, I think there are many papers and I'll come to them in the later part of the presentation, which have shown that probably the worst outcome of ACLF is in um, SAH ACLF, severe alcoholic hepatitis that has gone on to one or multi-organ failure. And these are the group of patients that often have 50, 70, 60, 70% 70 mortality. So uh, yes, they should be treated differently. Steroids for SAH can often not be used in people with ACLF, while they can be used in uh, without organ failure more easily. And that is where the most experience with steroids is uh, available. 
Sir, I'll take two quick questions before uh, we, we resume your talk. Uh, because I think they're they are very rational, uh, important questions what they've asked. So one is by Dr. Bhavesh Bhut from uh, Bhavnagar. And he asks, uh, what is the rationale of including mortality as one of the defining criteria? Yes, something that I've been pointing out repeatedly in our group. Bhavesh happens to be sitting in Lucknow these days. Uh, well, um, uh, uh, as a defining inclusion criteria, it has no place. It cannot be included for any prospective inclusion. It can only be applied retrospectively once the disease has run its course. Nevertheless, in group definitions for choosing criteria for statistical analysis of databases and for giving you all these scoring systems and severity indices, the cutoff criteria of ACLF is no different from any other liver failure until you talk about its severe form and the risk of high risk of mortality it carries related to organ failures. So from that point of view, what is a severe organ failure? Right in the seminar, I thought I mentioned in one of my slides that uh, Richard Moro and their co-workers used a cutoff of 15% or higher to differentiate ACLF from no ACLF in, the, um, in their canonic cohort, which is now the, taken as the basic of most of these studies. So as a part of definition, it has a place to identify the syndrome. But it does not work when you're trying to use these definitions to prospectively recruit patients. Uh, so the last question before we resume your talk. Uh, this was originally asked by Dr. Anand from Chennai. And then I think at least four other pe people have asked this question. Is how do you differentiate between ACLF and decomp acute decomposition of chronic liver disease? Well, that is a difficult question because it is a question of semantics. Throughout, you will see in the easel definition and canonics, they talk only of acute decompensation in cirrhosis. While the apazel group insists that it is uh, an acute insult on an underlying chronic liver disease. Now, this is a relevant question of acute decompensation when you already have a person who is labeled as cirrhotic or who has previously decompensated, where the acute decompensation is seen as a fresh insult. Whereas in a person who has non-fibrotic liver disease, or that is the type A WGO or the type B WGO, that it is compensated hitherto undiagnosed liver cirrhosis, then the, an acute insult which results in the precipitation of liver failure, uh, identifying that becomes uh, important. And uh, so I think uh, in terms of Practical relevance and management, probably acute decompensation would be relevant if a person is known to have previous cirrhosis, while an acute insult in a patient not known to have this condition would work better. I think that is uh, as far as I can see. Great, sir. I, I think you can resume your talk, sir. Okay. Thank you, Akash. We move on. Now, coming to the question of pathogenesis of acute on chronic liver failure. As I've said, the central thing that has been identified by both Eastern and Western groups is the development of organ failure in people with um, uh, existing or uh, 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 diagnosed or already advanced liver cirrhosis. And the three major components that play a role in this are portal hypertension, a leaky gut, and the development of liver injury due to an acute insult. Now, as you well know, in a cirrhotic liver, in chronic liver disease, obstruction to portal flow, resultant shear stress and release of vasodilators from vessels results in splanchnic vasodilatation and a decreased effective arterial blood volume, which results in significant major hemodynamic changes and activation of endogenous vasoconstrictor systems that serves as a substrate for the development of organ failures. Portal hypertension also contributes to the development of a leaky gut there are many other factors, including gut dysbiosis in the gut and a very high portal pressure. And this results in the leaky gut and the breach of the intestinal mucosal barrier, intestinal permeability barrier results in translocation of gut bacteria and products, activating pathogen, activated um, um, molecular path, uh, associated molecular patterns that exacerbates the splanchnic vasodilatation and further results in activation of a host of immune cells, resulting in a, a systemic inflammatory state of a more greater or lesser severity being unleashed by the release of chemokines, cytokines, nitric oxide, 
and translocation also results in a, pre, a propensity for increased bacterial infections that exacerbate this entire process. While an acute insult, either related to portal hypertension or due to a variety of insults causing necrosis of the liver cells, releases damage associated molecular patterns that in turn, all of these uh, amplify the systemic immune uh, response that is ongoing and eventually target various organs resulting in organ failures and the development of acute and chronic liver failure. Now, what are these damps and PAMPs? In a fibrotic liver, the damage associated molecular patterns are products of hepatocyte necrosis like HMGB1, mitochondrial DNA, ATP uric acid, and a variety of other molecules. While pathogens associated molecular patterns may be actually live bacteria, but more of often parts of the back of uh, the bacterial cell wall like the lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin, peptid peptidoglycans, bacterial DNA, and other fungal components, which uh, activate host innate immune reactivity activity through pattern recognition receptors, the TLR store-like receptors or the nod-like receptors, which in turn through Second messenger mechanisms, uh, TLRs and NLRs act, they act differently to release a flood of inflammatory cytokines and then trigger sepsis, SIRS, CARS, and organ failure. Um, and uh, this whole uh, gamut is shown in greater detail in this cartoon. And the two central events being acute hepatic insult and a pre existent dysbiosis resulting in a leaky gut, and which relate uh, release inflammatory mediators by active, acting on a variety of intrahepatic cells that are shown in this panel, resulting in elevated pro-inflammatory cytokines uh, in the systemic circulation, products of inflammation and hepatocyte death, uh, the systemic immune response syndrome, which may then wane into the compensatory anti-inflammatory response syndrome, circulatory changes, organ failure, and thus the full-blown syndrome of ACLF. Now, the single most important event that probably affects outcome in people with ACLF is the development of overt bacterial infections. And uh, in the inasal consortium studies, about 16% were found to have uh, seps, uh, back, um, present with infections, which was 25% uh, in the ARC consortium. And in the patient with severe alcoholic hepatitis series, over 50% either present or after steroids develop infections which dramatically changes their course and outcome. This sepsis is multifactorial, but the major factors contributing are the increased intestinal permeability resulting in bacterial translocation, endotoxemia, release of circulatory BDNA and other damps and pamps that I spoke of in the previous slide, which in turn relieves in a, at a low grade level in the CAD or the cirrhosis associated immune dysfunction in which uh, the endotoxins or the uh, lipopolysaccharides are responsible for macrophage monocyte dysfunction and neutrophil dysfunction. And this then results in an increased propensity to the development of infections. Now coming to increased intestinal permeability in ACLF, this is the normal intestinal permeability barrier the unstirred outer mucus layer normally mucus layer can open be penetrated only by a few bacteria because it is guarded by various antimicrobial proteins or secretory IgA. The intact epithelial uh, mucosal um, epithelial barrier, as well as the transcellular pathway sealed by tight junctions, serves as a third important mechanism to protect the mucosa and finally a subepithelial immune cells the iga macrophages um, and gamma delta intraepithelial lymphocytes are all mechanisms that help to prevent the penetration of bacteria now how does one study the intestinal barrier the lactose uh, the lactulose mannitol ratio which was usually measured by hplc but we have been doing it at sgpgi using proton nmr techniques uh, checks for a leaky, leaky gut using mannitol, which is uh, uh, passes through the transcellular pathway, while villus atrophy, which, in, uh, which decreases mannitol absorption. And lactulose is a molecule that tests the paracellular pathway. The method is briefly shown here and was standardized at SGPGI in a paper that Dr. Ghoshal from our center published way back in 2009. Uh, 
uh, we have looked at these data in a study that we have published recently uh, from the Central Biomedical Research uh, bio, uh, for Biomedical Research, where we have looked at the uh, LMR ratio and the intestinal permeability in healthy controls, which is quite low. In people with compensated cirrhosis, we found that the bacterial per the intestinal permeability is increased and a dramatic jump in this permeability has been noted in acute and chronic liver failure. And it is this leaky gut that is probably respond responsible for the huge flood of noxious agents and uh, cytokines. And in the recent study that uh, we are still analyzing, we have been able to find a correlation of a similar nature between healthy controls, compensated cirrhosis, and decompensated cirrhosis prior to the development of ACLF in the pro-inflammatory cytokines, endotoxin, and CD64 levels in the circulatory um, system. Now, in ACLF, a precipitous rise in portal pressure is probably a cause for a dramatic increase in intestinal permeability, and that uh, may serve as one of the reasons why uh, extra hepatic organ failure sets in. Decongesting the bowel uh, may, by an effective means, which we have been doing in our center by using uh, diuretics with albumin and tertipressin, improves, has been, we have observed, in, improves extra hepatic organ function as well as 28 day survival. And therapies that target gut microbiota and intestinal permeability, for example, fecal uh, microbiota transplant, probiotics, and other agents. Um, Dr. Rajiv Jalan is working on uh, um, uh, activated charcoal for absorbing bacterial products, which is in a, research, in, a, in a conceptual stage at present. These may be newer approaches that may help us to modulate the intestinal permeability. Uh, the Jalan group has also studied at the effects of um, uh, this increased IP and the impairment it causes uh, due to uh, the um, bacterial products that leak into the systemic, uh, systemic circulatory in polym uh, polymorph uh, function. They looked at um, the resting oxidative neutrophil burst in three sets of patients, controlled cirrhotics and cirrhotics with the al severe alcoholic hepatitis in response to stimuli uh, like FMLP, E. coli, and they also studied the relative granulocyte monocyte uh, uh, fluorescence index. And as you can see here, in cirrhosis, the resting oxidative burst is increased and is further increased by uh, these stimulants, while neutrophil dysfunction is apparent by a blunting of the GMFI response. And in the group of cirrhosis with alcoholic hepatitis, there's already a very high rest, uh, resting oxidative burst, which is hardly increased by these stimuli. And there is significant impairment of neutrophil function by shown by a drop in this index. Now, looking at the significance of these, when they correlated with survival patterns, they found that those with a resting higher oxidative burst, as well as those with poorer phagocytosis, had poorer survival at uh, 90 days. And uh, similar studies from the same group have shown that circulatory neutrophil dysfunction in cirrhosis is associated with a poor 90-day and a poor one-day mortality, so thus showing that neutrophil dysfunction is an important component in the uh, causation of increased infection infections in ACLF, particularly with related to alcoholic hepatitis. Now, this brings us to the point that early diagnosis of acute infections probably plays a crucial role and may help us in managing our patients with ACLF better. And what are these different tools that we have for early diagnosis of infection? Commonly, we use biomarkers like TLC, CRP, and procalcitonin which do not help us much in differentiating between inflammation and sepsis. They go up in both situations. There are a couple of newer biomarkers like the neutrophil CD64 expression and uh, bacterial DNA in the circulation that can help us in differentiating between situations like severe alcoholic hepatitis where inflammation is present and when bacterial infection gets superimposed on this condition, how do we differentiate? So neutrophil CD4 exp expression is constitutionally seen on macrophages, monocytes, eosinophils, as well as neutrophils. And uh, in response to microbial wall components, complement split products or pro-inflammatory cytokines, the neutrophil uh, CD64 expression goes up significantly. Within four to six hours of exposure, thus uh, uh, earmarking this as an early marker in the very early stage of the development of a leaky gut, 
or an increase of crossing of the of thresholds that CD64 goes up. And it may be useful in distinguishing infection from inflammation without infection in patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis and ACLF. Now, CD64 has been used extensively in immunology rheumatology circles, but not so much in hepatology circles. And we recently carried out a study at SGPGI in which using 20 controls and 68 patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis who were categorized into those with proven or probable infection vis-a-vis -vis patients with SAH without infection in whom CD64 uh, expression as well as Procal, CRP and the other biomarkers and including neutrophil lymphocyte ratios were studied and the criteria used for proven and probable infection are as uh, shown in these boxes. With these, we found that 30 patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis uh, were only were present without infections, while 38 patients had uh, either proven or probable infection. And in them, neutrophil CD expression shown in this uh, in, uh, scatter plot was able to differentiate quite well between those who had active bacterial infection vis-a-vis -vis those who had inflammation but no bacterial infection, while control levels were very much low lower and the cut hole, the cutoff threshold that we found effective in this discrimination between bacterial infection and no infection was around 26% and in other uh, studies generally less than 30%. When we looked at how this test performed in terms of identif identifying bacterial infection against the other molecules, we found that the ROC, the area under the curve was the best for CD64 counts at almost 95% although Procal also was quite useful as was CRP and others gave this values while the combinations performed in the same range. So ND in the CD64 counts were quite useful. Now circulating bacterial DNA has been available for a long time and is often present in patients with decompensated cirrhosis. In the recent STOPA trial that was carried out in severe alcoholic hepatitis, a follow-up study was published in which results of the 16S bacterial DNA quantitation were shown and these were present in 90% of patients in the blood especially and the levels were significantly higher than seen in decompensated cirrhosis. They found that a cutoff of about 18.5 picograms per ml best predicted infection within seven days of starting steroids with 80% specificity. And a higher 90-day mortality was seen when the BDNA cutoff was above uh, this threshold. So early onset of new bacterial infection within seven days of uh, starting steroids predicts non-response to steroids. And often the, um, uh, it may even uh, abort the LIL assessment because infections, regardless of the LIL response, will obviate the continued use of uh, corticosteroids and a threshold of 18.5 picogram per ml seems to be useful. Using this cutoff, a few trials are underway in which corticosteroid therapy under cover of antibiotics is being and guided by BDNA levels has been initiated and their reports results will be awaited with great interest. So can BDNA help us to guide duration of antibiotic therapy before starting corticosteroids and during corticosteroid therapy are questions that hopefully these ongoing studies will answer. So now coming quickly to the question of management of infections in ACLF, I'll refer to this algorithm published in the 2018 by Professor Sarin and co-workers. Patients with acute and chronic liver failure usually have uh, SIRS and this may be just SIRS due related to inflammation or may be associated with sepsis. Anybody with either sepsis or SIRS is a candidate for initiation of antibiotic therapy and review within about 72 hours. In case the patient improves, you can de-escalate. In case a culture turns out to be positive, the patient can be escalated to appropriate antibiotics. However, on empirical antibiotic therapy, if there is no improvement as shown by development of new features as are shown in this box, this would be an indication to broaden the spectrum of antibacterial coverage and add antifungal agents. However, in people without surge or overt sepsis and who do not have, um, uh, who, uh, have uh, infection, who do not have infection suspected or proved, there is no need to start antibiotics and you can be followed without antibiotics. But 
despite absence of certs, if there is a strong suspicion of infection, for example, in x-ray tests showing an infiltrative patch, one would start antibiotics and escalation would then depend on the response to antibiotics in 72 hours as you would go on. The specifics of which agent to use in which setting are often guided by local center choices or their sensitivity patterns. So in this segment, I think I'd like to conclude this part about infections, showing that it is a major concern in liver uh, disease and the debate of whether it is a precipitant or is a complication is uh, superfluous. Infections are a major factor at uh, influencing outcome and detecting and developing better tools for early detection to allow more uh, rational and earlier treatment um, uh, for infection in people with SAH and ACLF is important. It may help in standardizing empirical therapy and uh, novel approaches to decrease the prevalence of infections like manipulating gut microbiota with FMT or using agents that might influence intestinal permeability are newer approaches for the management of ACLF to which one looks forward. Coming to other aspects on the management of acute and chronic liver failure, the central tenets that one would talk about are management of the specific etiology, the acute precipitant or the underlying disease. And I'll be mainly talking about some aspects of severe alcoholic hepatitis. Management of SAH is well beyond the purview of this talk. Corticosteroids and other uh, debates are so extensive that they will be part of another talk in this ongoing series at some point. Management of HBV ACLF I'll be addressing. Why AIH, Wilson's disease, all of these need, are niche areas seen in small patients, small sets of patients, and they do need independent management. Management of complications of liver failure is uh, as you would manage portal hypertensive GI bleeding, management continues to be similar. Ascites mobilization is a moot point. Many people do not emphasize ascites mobilization except for doing LVPs when forced. However, in our center, we have been working on ascites mobilization, mobilization using a um, uh, response guided paradigm regime, which I have spoken of in various fora on various occasions. The data are too numerous and too vast to be discussed here. And I'll also reserve this uh, for some uh, future point in time. Another cardinal part of management of, is early detection and identification of infection that I've just dealt with in the previous set of slides. And finally, management of extrahepatic organ failures, acute uh, kidney injuries, and the various forms of, of uh, organ failure are with multi-organ support modalities, are ICU level managements and regimes that need to be uh, followed in detail and depending on the individual combination in the given patient. I will, in the remaining few minutes left to me in this talk, try to talk to you about antivirals for hepatitis B virus related ACLF the role of GCSF for severe alcoholic hepatitis and some data on fecal microbiota transplant for uh, severe alcoholic hepatitis related ACLF. The short term prognosis, some early studies in 2002-2005 before the more potent antivirals were available suggested that the short term prognosis of exacerbations of chronic hepatitis B reactivation leading to ACLF was extremely poor with a very high mortality, with the liver transplant as being the only definitive therapy. Lamivudine was not found to be superior to controls, but with the uh, introduction of tenofovir, a potent, rapidly acting, high genetic barrier nucleoside analog, highly effective in suppressing HBV replication, a new era in the treatment of HBV ACLF was launched, exemplified by the first randomized controlled trial published by Hitendra Garg and uh, Shev Sarin, from, from J.B. Panth Hospital in 2011. In a cohort of 90 ACLF, they identified 27 patients with HBV reactivation due to chronic hepatitis B, 14 of whom were treated with tenofovir and 13 with placebo. And a significant improvement in survival at three months was noted in this subset, as shown also in this Kaplan-Meier uh, uh, chart. They further found that not among the survivors, the severity indices like CTP meld improved and there was a fall in HBV DNA noted at two weeks. And in fact, they found predicting a two log or more reduction re predicted survival, finding a two log or more reduction at two weeks predicted survival 
<coughs> while um, uh, an absence of this predicted a poor outcome. Subsequently, this was part of the ARC consensus recommendations in 2014. Several studies have also confirmed the value of this two log reduction in two weeks and immediate introduction of uh, nucleoside analogs at uh, the diagnosis of HBV ACLF is uh, recommended with potent antiviral agents as shown here and checking the decline of HBV DNA at two weeks. In fact, there are some ongoing studies which are looking at whether as in acute liver failure, the use of potent dual potent like tenofovir and intercovir combinations may actually hasten the decline of DNA and thus improve outcomes in these very sick ALF, ACLF patients. Now coming to the role of granulocyte colony stimulating factor in ACLF, the rationale with which it was introduced was that it was thought to improve hepat uh, hepatic regeneration by mobilizing CD34 cells. A large body of data on the use of mesenchymal stem cells, hemopoietic stem cell infusions showing that it might improve hepatic regeneration had gathered. And this uh, GMCSF infusion mobilizes CD34 positive cells from the uh, bone marrow pool and these can home in on the liver where improved regeneration has been documented in experimental models as well as in some human data. Dr. Sarin has shown that uh, uh, liver biopsies in these people showed a higher CD34 count after GMCSF. Also, HGF and hepatic progenitor cell proliferation was found to be increased in experimental as well as human biopsy data. Also, there was some thought, as was found in glycogen storage type 1b, that it, uh, GMCSF may correct neutrophil dysfunction we have spoken about, which in the earlier set of slides. The first uh, study that was a random uh, the trial that was published using GMCSF was again by the ILBS group in 2012, in which 47% with the 47 patients with ACLF after certain exclusions were randomized to GCSF and the placebo. And the 60 day survival as well as liver, uh, liver severity in disease were assessed and a significant improvement in 60 day survival as well as in liver severity in disease was reported in these studies as well as effective mobilization of CD34 positive cells in the peripheral blood as well as in the liver biopsy tissue were reported. There are impressive changes in the treated patients vis-a-vis -vis the um, uh, untreated patients in uh, the severity in disease and the conclusion of this study was that more than a twofold uh, increase, uh, uh, increase in the percentage of patients who survived two months was noted with GMCSF therapy as well as improvement in other organ failures was reported uh, by this group. Shortly thereafter, a Chinese study uh, studying patients with HBV ACLF also reported favorable results in 55 patients with HBV ACLF randomized to GCSF versus uh, placebo after certain exclusions and monitoring peripheral CD34 count as well as liver function indices and improved survival at three months. That was two months. This was three months was noted in almost half of these patients. Uh, and uh, they concluded that GCSF did promote CD34 cell mobilization from the marrow and, and uh, also concomitant improvement in liver function. Subsequently, a number of studies almost exclusively from the Indian subcontinent. Uh, three studies from the ILBS group. Uh, his, this Chinese study I spoke about. Uh, Anil Arora's group from Gangaram, Virinder Singh from Chandigarh have published in a recent Mamun has published, Mamun al Matab has published from Bangladesh. These studies uh, have uh, two of them on ACLF three of them or four of them on decompensated cirrhosis using various combinations and randomized control trials often placebo control have been shown and in general they have reported improved patient survival at two months three months even up to 12 months in these three or four studies with improvement in liver uh, severity of the liver function indices however interest has been aroused by this study that has come from the uk the Europe, that is uh, Phil Newsom and his group from uh, three centers in UK published this study using decompensated liver cirrhosis with a meld of between 11 and 15.5.
in three groups who received either GCSF or GCSF plus autologous stem cell infusions on three occasions versus standard medical therapy. And not only did they find no significant improvement in MELD at short intervals over a period of 30 of 90 days, but they also reported a higher complication rate with GCSF and uh, stem cell inf infusion groups in particular. Uh, a recent uh, publication that has appeared in the Journal of Clinical and Experiment, the Inazel Journal in 2020 by Abby Phillips, uh, in uh, patients with advanced decompensated liver cirrhosis, a large number, 56 patients were reported in this group, and they were compared with historical controls. CTP is quite high, MELD was above 24, and open label GCSF was used and they actually reported deleterious or harmful effects in patients treated with GCSF with shorter survival at six months than with historical controls with equal severity, with death being related to sepsis or liver failure, and worse CTP and higher complication rates even at six months in this uh, cohort. This is just uh, to tell you about the, um, the realistic trial that uh, I just spoke to you in the previous slide in uh, brief. Those interested can actually go and read the full reference. Uh, uh, we will finally, yeah, that last uh, few slides. I think we took a lot of questions in the middle. I'll take another two or three minutes uh, now. So we come to the conundrum of uh, use of JCS, JCSF in advanced liver disease. And in a very good review, Abby Phillips has recently shown that while there are these black things tell you in the, uh, the clinical uh, reasons why one favors GCSF, although some of these are not so well established, are only um, uh, shown in a very small numbers. And these are the molecular mechanisms which show how these uh, effects, favorable effects are obtained. But at the same time, in the same group of patients, negative effects like development of sepsis, predisposition to HCC and other effects on liver function by these various mechanisms have been shown. So at the moment, it appears that more basic research in identifying subsets of patients who where this uh, therapy would work and more clinical data are required before GCSF therapy can be used widely and more studies are needed. Finally, some important slides on FMT in severe acute hepatitis. FMT, as you've talked about gut dysbiosis and the variety of factors as shown in this cartoon and already discussed in this uh, presentation earlier, our, um, FMT may modify the gut microbiota and may correct many of these adverse events. And in fact, the first pilot trial of FMT in severe alcoholic hepatitis in patients who were steroid ineligible again came from ILB, from ILBS. And again, uh, Abby Phillips and Dr. Shiv Sareen were the lead authors eight patients who were corticosteroid ineligible because of active infections or recent GI bleed received FMT from healthy donors and they were compared with 18 historical controls treated at the same time. As you can see, they had very high severity in disease by health, MELD and CTP score. Improvement was noted within 17 days and over a mean follow-up of almost one year, only one of the FMT patients died versus 12 of 18 who had uh, not received FMT and there was good improvement in the CTP indices. And the results of FMT in the temp term of bacterial species being pro noted at six to 12 months in the recipient, as well as improved mechanisms were reported. Finally, I think a large study has recently been reported in the form of a letter to the editor in the Journal of Hepatology by Abby Phillips from Kerala of the use of FMT in steroid ineligible severe alcoholic hepatitis with ACLF. They've used it in 88 patients, 23 of whom have been followed for uh, 18 months, 1.5 years, and uh, with either low grade or high grade ACLF at presentation with the mean C ACLF score of 93.6. Remember 70 was mentioned as the futility level in ACLF. High CTP differential and the MELD uh, scores, and they had a 66% survival at one and a half years. Again, the late deaths were at quite late, almost at 40, 400 days of survival. And 
which compares extremely favorably with the high mortality of ACLF2 and ACLF3 patients uh, at uh, 90 days. And grade 1, 72% survival. Grade 2, higher grades of ACLF, 58% survival, which are good results, which encourage these authors to speculate that in these steroid ineligible group of patients who are candidates or who are not candidates for either transplant or corticosteroids, uh, before declaring futility of treatment, it may be worthwhile considering FMT as a salvage option. With this, I think uh, there are uh, algorithms for modulating this and the interest in FMT is shown by these large number of ongoing trials in liver disease. Liver transplant from ACLF, I am not covering. It is too large and too vast a topic for this presentation. And with this, I'd like to leave you with this brief algorithm in acute on chronic liver failure. This is in South Asia using the ARC criteria, acute insult should be identified and if treatable, it should be treated in this manner. Using the ARC score, if the score is less than 10 uh, uh, or less than 11, with, uh, which is generally in the presence of extra hepatic organ failure, this should be reviewed at day and day four and day seven and therapies are offered moving on to transplant or supportive care or utility of care. Here is where FMT might be considered. And uh, with this, I thank you very much for your attention. And I come to my second audience poll question, which you should see on your screen regarding the use of corticosteroids for severe alcoholic hepatitis. You can choose your option from A to E and uh, press the vote button at the end of your screens. And uh, now, while we take questions, we'll get the answers to the audience poll from the moderators. Thank you all very much and over to you, Govin. Uh, the question is yet to come to audience because this takes about 20 seconds. So I've been watching on the Facebook and question has come just now. So you can respond to this question and we'll look for what were the response. Uh, Denise, after this, you can uh, change the screen from Dr. Salso to your screen uh, to show the responses to these two questions. We will wait for 10 seconds and then we go to uh, if uh, Dr. Salso, if you can stop showing your screen and we right. can go back to responses. Uh, Dinesh, can you show the responses please? Uh, meanwhile, uh, thank you very much uh, Dr. Salso for a wonderful exhaustive talk on a very important topic. Uh, there have been a lot of dif differences in the definitions, uh, quite difficult to understand, but uh, uh, you did a great job. And I think uh, most people, many questions will be asked about definition. And uh, I'm sure that uh, we got the answer about that. Uh, with this, I leave, uh, 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 I invite Dr. Akas to take the questions further on. And we have about more than uh, 200 questions already uh, listed here. So Akas, please. Akas, you are mute. Akas, you are mute. It's unmuted. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saraswat, for uh, for covering this very difficult topic in such a lucid manner, uh, in such a short time. Uh, there, as Dr. Uh, Govin said, uh, there are more than 200 questions. I've uh, chosen some which have been asked by multiple people. Uh, first is a very interesting question asked by Dr. Atanu from Bongai Gao. He says that uh, most patients with ACLF uh, have a history of taking complementary and alternative medicine. Now, in this situation, how can we be sure that what is the contribution of these CAM in the pathogenesis and do we treat these patients any differently than, than others? If, if the patient has uh, acute on chronic liver failure, any severe form of liver failure, any and every medication, CAM or others, need to be stopped straight away. That is the first thing I would say. Whether or not this CAM has contributed or not, again, there was a JCH paper again from Abby Phillips in Kerala in which they have looked at this closely and given you some pointers and the reasons why they have suspected CAM in their patients, which you could use to guide your decision making. But in most situations, especially in the absence of prospective monitoring, it is very difficult to be sure of the role of uh, CAM and alternative medicines, and it may remain unanswered. As to how to treat them, I can really not think of uh, any uh, different ways of therapy. 
except that uh, not for CAM, but for anti-tuberculous related toxicity, people have used n cysteine in small numbers and in a few studies and NAC uh, when uh, there is ongoing, of course, you withdraw the ATT, but along with them, the use of NAC seems to ameliorate the severity of liver disease. But again, these are data that need to be validated in larger numbers and in larger uh, from larger centers before one can recommend its use. But these are kind of things that you would do in desperate situations. So everybody seems to know that Samudra Manthan, he will not just Amrit, but also the Halahal that Lord Shiva has in his gullet uh, till this day, and the Kam Dhenu. Uh, the others, no, no, Devi Mohini is associated with this episode because she duped the Danavs and gave all the Amrit uh, to the Devtas, the, to the Devas. Right, so that is the Samudra Manthan question answered quite well by the majority. And the next. Uh, right, so futility of the Lil score, if it is more than 0.5, is absolutely the correct answer. Uh, in fact, uh, if the BDNA is less than 18, the risk of bacterial infection is lower as it is if the CD count is uh, less than 30%. And uh, um, uh, uh, antibiotic cover is, yes, there is no doubt that you should use it with fluoride infection, but it can, people are not talking about continuing, even in the absence of infection, but if the BDNA is high, CD64 is high, you could use steroids under cover of uh, uh, antibiotics. So that's so much for the panel questions and back to you, Akash. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, I think a lot of people have, Dr. Pathek asked from uh, uh, Ahmedabad and then later on, many people have asked this question. What is the role of plasma exchange in uh, management of uh, ACRF today? Yes, indeed. I think ever since the um, European study on ALF came along with plasma phoresis, people have started using um, plasma exchanges. There are published reports in small numbers from and I know of multiple centers in India where plasma phoresis is being used. The situation when these people usually fall back on is when uh, there is organ failure, um, moderately severe organ failure. Patients are often not uh, candidates for liver transplant. And if at times there may be active infections where you can't use corticosteroid in the setting of alcoholic hepatitis, then plasma phoresis may serve to remove the noxious agents that are leaking from the gut as well as those cytokines, uh, their levels may be reduced. And the beneficial results from uh, ILBS, I think I'm aware uh, from uh, CMC Velour and uh, from many other centers in smaller numbers have been reported. But these are often uncontrolled studies in small numbers and uh, in a very sick patient with multi-organ failure who may be hemodynamically unstable, who may be having renal failure, it is not possible to use plasma phoresis. So it can only be confined to those with severe disease and mild or the plasma, uh, pl mild organ failure, certainly not circulatory instability or advanced kidney failure requiring um, uh, CRRT. Right, sir. Thank you, sir. Next question is from by Dr. Anand from Mumbai. And he asks, uh, what is uh, the safety of uh, tapping more than five liters of fluid? in a patient with ACLF? And is it safe to replace with albumin and and, and, and and do we manage them the same way as we do serotics? Well, um, in ACLF, by and large, when the pre you are talking of people with organ failures and in people with organ failures, management of the organ failure is the uh, first priority and uh, tapping is only resorted to in situations where there's increased intra-abdominal pressure and a compartment syndrome or impending rupture of an umbilical hernia and in such situations. And I think in this, it is difficult to categorize all ACLF patients together. They need to be substratified depending on their status. In hemodynamically unstable people, in people with uh, uh, hypotension or with people with uh, uh, kidney failure, it is very difficult to give albumin replacement. Albumin replacement is not possible. In other situations where there is less severe organ failure, and milder degrees of organ dysfunction, it may be possible to use uh, um, uh, tapping with albumin infusion, but tapping without albumin infusion will definitely precipitate or risk worsening the post due to post paracentesis circulatory dysfunction. It will risk uh, worsening renal failure. 
uh, or make a patient who does not have renal failure go into renal failure if you do not provide albumin support. So a lot of juggling and balancing has to be done with the use of these therapies, particularly LVP with albumin support uh, in people with ACLF. Uh, Dr. Sharad Dev from uh, Varanasi asks, uh, what is the exact role of NAC and GMCSF in centers which do not have transplant facility? Should they be trying this in ACLF patients? Well, GMCSF we have talked about. GMCSF, I think early on people have realized the latest paper that was published from ILBS has talked about using uh, this in patients with um, with the um, less than with a MELD score of less than 16 and only showing benefit in those. So you're talking of the narrow group of 11 to 16. Uh, uh, the recent data from uh, Kerala seems to show that in people with advanced liver failure or with it is very it may be risky and may be counterproductive to use GMCSF. So regardless of whether you are a transplant center or not a transplant center, the window for the use of GMCSF appears to be quite narrow. And if you are to believe the results of the realistic trial, the, even in this narrow window from 11 to 15.5, they reported a poor outcome. But this poor outcome was dominantly in the subgroup with the GCSF was used along with stem cell transfusions on three occasions. What role the stem cell transfusion played in the negative outcome, one can't say. But the results were there, but not as bad as when GCSF alone was used. So that's so much so for GCSF. For NAC in ACLF, I think the data are very flimsy. The, uh, for non-paracetamol acute liver failure, there are stronger data, particularly from the King's College group in the UK, where you could consider using it. On analogy, no. Probably NAC in this situation would more be therapy to bolster the confidence of the physician rather than benefit the patient too much. I'd say instead of doing nothing and uh, masterly inactivity, you might choose to use NAC. But uh, I don't uh, have uh, access to much data showing benefit with NAC in ACLF. Uh, thank you, sir. The, another interesting uh, point which uh, people have asked, Dr. Krishna from Hyderabad and Dr. Nilesh from Surat, I've asked about the use of uh, beta blockers in patients with ACLF. So we had on one hand initially uh, people stopping uh, the use of beta blockers as soon as ACLF was diagnosed. And on the other hand, now we have a paper which says that beta blockers, even in the absence of varices, may actually improve survival. So can you give a broad guideline as to what uh, should be done by the... Difficult, physician? difficult. Life is becoming difficult with the beta blockers. I thought it was all very clear, window open, window shut. You get a low map, you develop uh, uh, ACLF and ascites, you stop beta blockers. This new uh, paper uh, in the ACLF has um, uh, stirred up uh, the old debate once again. So possibly in a subset of ACLF, uh, beneficial effect of beta blockers may still be seen. But what is very, very clear is that beta blockers have a negative effect on hemodynamics in general. So if your map is below 85, below 80, you should certainly not be looking at. The mean arterial pressure has to be in the high 80s or 90s if you are comfortable, uh, if you want to continue with beta blockers. The benefit of beta blockers, again, needs to be further looked at closely in subset analyses to identify those subsets where the benefit was identified and stick to those. And my guess is it is going to be in people with the lower severities of ACLF, again in the 11 to 16 meld uh, bracket, and in those who have a map above um, 80, 85 millimeters of mercury. Thank you, sir. Uh, one important topic, uh, sir, which we sort of, uh, we, we didn't discuss, uh, obviously because of want of time, you have not included, is about transplant. But I think one of the key questions which, uh, which many people have asked in, in different ways, including Dr. Piyush Thakur from uh, Varanasi and and many others, is about the timing of uh, transplant in patients with ACLF. Uh, the key thing is uh, we can do it very early in the course of disease, but then you have a problem of uh, probably transplanting some of those patients who might recover. On the other hand, if you delay it by a few days, very often infection sets in and then you lose that window and you lose a lot of patients. So should you be doing very early or you should be doing after the patient has recovered from this acute episode and has sort of stabilized enough to undergo transplant safety. So what 
what will be the right timing for these patients yes i think that in itself uh, forms a 10 minute segment on the liver transplant and aclf because this is the crucial question to too early uh, or too late see if there is a treatable etiology of identified like hbv aclf there is no question you would first treat and not rush in for transplant so i think we are having excellent results and in fact now in people with advanced aclf uh, the role of very rapid lowering of viral load to increase uh, the uh, time to improvement in organ failure severity by using dual potent antivirals is being explored so uh, there you would not similarly if a patient is eligible for corticosteroids is in that window uh, one may consider using corticosteroids in the um, and uh, if you get a, fa a favorable response and the lil score drops below 0.5 45 then yes you may avoid a transplant but uh, most people transplanting for severe alcoholic hepatitis in india are not comfortable using steroids because um, the of the high risk of development of bacterial infections early on and that keep taking people off the transplant list because of severe uh, infections so if you do not have a treatable etiology then uh, you are on a very narrow window and i think professor sarin and his group has been talking of this golden window which is a very short period of time of 5 to 7 days from hospitalization till worsening organ failure or infection set in and repeated in my talk i have emphasized the uh, dominance of infection in influencing the outcome so uh, while research areas are focusing on ways to decrease the risk of infection and to manage these infections better and time them better in terms of transplant it is very very difficult and probably timing of transplant may also be helped by screening with cd64 and bacterial dna levels to pick up sub clinical low grade bacterial infections that may be ongoing in these patients to better choose those who are not likely to run into the problem of infections post aclf having said that the results with transplant in aclf have been quite uh, encouraging up to 70% one year survival 70 to 80 percent one-year survivals with from in large groups from Eastern Asia and from some a few Indian centers also in the North Asian centers. Short answer. Short answer. Yeah, that's it. So basically, these are more questions we can take. Otherwise, uh, we'll get back to. Yeah. We one or two more questions. Akash. Yeah. So the interesting question, other is uh, use of corticosteroids in patients with. Uh, severe alcoholic hepatitis as well as with autoimmune hepatitis the question asked by many people again here is can we do this empirically for these two groups without doing a liver biopsy see in uh, both of these situations the diagnosis is often based on the liver biopsy the you are in a very difficult situation in diagnosing severe autoimmune hepatitis which often has a fulminant or a sub fulminant course without the help of a liver biopsy uh, markers may lead you astray we do not do the full panels of autoimmune markers that is done in the west we do only very few markers in our country in routine practice and uh, there is this interesting entity of autoimmune marker negative ih so uh, to diagnose ih confidently enough to put a very sick patient with possible organ failures onto steroid therapy is very difficult unless you have the confidence of a background of a clear cut biopsy diagnosis of aih when you would be treating the more aggressive with steroids manage complications more aggressively and try to work to success with auto in autoimmune hepatitis and the same applies for alcoholic hepatitis so in a severe alcoholic hepatitis with organ failure steroid therapy is not a panacea it is in fact does little good it all it does is uh, improve survival up to 28 days according to the to the stopa trial and that too in a minority of patient which may be 20 25% and a, a smaller number in our uh, thing so being keen to pe treat people with steroids in the absence of a confident diagnosis may be more counterproductive than beneficial so i think i would be reluctant to uh, offer steroids in these sick patients without the confidence of having histologic evidence yeah i think i think that can't agree more with the reasons also given that you cannot diagnose both these diseases without biopsy Now coming to one or two last questions. Yes, sir. Let me have to stop because it's all seven six twenty five. Okay. So you want to ask one last question? Yeah. Last I, question. Yeah, I think one last uh, relevant question is by Dr. Pradeep uh, from uh, Dehradun and also asked by Dr. Anil Kumar from Mysore. Is about nutrition. 
should we give early enteral nutrition to patients with aclf or should we give supported uh, nutrition and should we use probiotics or bcas or mcas in these patients uh, probiotics and is marketed as a nutritional supplement but is not truly a nutritional supplement so i think mixing probiotics with this is a bit inappropriate but early enteral nutrition often through an nj tube has been recommended has been found to be useful particularly in improving uh, the increased intestinal permeability which is a key uh, factor in the uh, causing infections and uh, resulting in a negative outcome and just as in acute pancreatitis so also early enteral nutrition in aclf in sick comatose patient may have a place in fact glutamine supplements being used uh, as a, a trophic agent so the enterocytes have also been reported to help and uh, branch chain amino acids and other agents also uh, have been used but i think i am aware of some data in favor of glutamine and in enteral nutrition in particular but not specifically about branch chain amino acids although i really see no nothing negative or deleterious because the more recent trials also do tend to support their improvement in hepatic encephalopathy and other beneficial effects to early enteral nutrition so yes certainly resorting to early enteral nutrition should be recommended in various situations not the least being that these people are completely anorectic they are tensely distended they often refuse to eat anything and to get anything down and including enteral nutrition is a bonus and may be considered early great sir that's it uh, thank you so much over to you to the thank you akash sir now like a lot of people are watching on facebook and uh, i think one or two question from facebook which is akash couldn't have seen what a question from chandan yadav uh, he uh, he asked that uh, can hcc precipitate aclf a very interesting question conceptually in an advanced cirrhosis actually hcc less so but more often post ablative therapies people who get ablated for hcc i think i right now i have uh, the opportunity to take care of a patient who had multiple hccs and went repeated ablations till he slept into aclf went uh, into liver failure and then underwent a liver transplant so hcc per se presenting as liver trans as uh, aclf i am not very sure that i have seen but uh, nothing being impossible in medicine i can't say that uh, it cannot happen uh, especially when complicated by vascular occlusions like uh, ehpv or bud or uh, bud chiari it can certainly do so uh, that's all i can say on this all right sir thank you so very much for a wonderful talk on on this topic uh, we have almost more than 250 questions we could take about a uh, 20 odd questions during this live session but certainly many of the question which we read through are very very relevant i think responding to these questions will be helpful to uh, our viewers so certainly these questions are on your way uh, so okay. so so and for for your kind response uh thank you very much dr akas for a, a wonderful moderation of this session and you have been so graceful uh, for the whole of this uh, uh, program was seen today by many people on facebook and almost 1500 on on the live on the the uh, the master class the uh, we had two more things to do uh, one was that uh, the uh, the uh, the question we asked two question we asked there was some delay uh, in showing the questions and looking at response so we'll coordinate that uh, much better next time that we have been we are talking about doing a uh, online or or virtual bed sites we are still working on that and we'll come back to you by sunday on that and at the same time as for your response uh, th that uh, we would like to continue with this uh, master classes uh, from uh, we we'll continue rather than doing two we'll do one we have a three more master classes and then we have set up for more master classes uh, but do on sunday 12 to 1 uh the next talk will be delivered by uh, on a very important topic uh, how do you image a, a liver sols and how do you interpret that and i think most clinician have a this question in their mind and all of us see liver sols every time in our practice so we thought that uh, let's explore 
that uh, how do we how do we assess and how do we interpret uh, liver imaging liver as well and for that uh, we have invited dr raju sharma he is a professor of radio diagnosis at uh, all in institute of medical science and he is a great speaker speaking at me in your office and uh, will know him uh, already so he will speak on day that is uh, may 17 uh, from 12 to 1 on um, sunday may sunday may 17 12 to 1 dr uh, raju sharma will speak on imaging of liver as well and how to interpret that with that uh, uh, thank you again dr saraswat uh, thank you dr akash for the wonderful talk and uh, Uh, we we will like log off from here thank you the technical team thank you yogita and thank you sun pharma for supporting them we can log off now thank you very much and bye bye okay bye bye see you bye thank you thank you akash